All righty. Uh, good, evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the September edition of the uh, monthly meeting of the Ottawa Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, we've got a very exciting program uh, tonight and also a very jam-packed program. Uh, so to start off, I'd just like to ask uh, that everyone that is speaking and presenting, uh, that you be as, uh, as brief as possible with, with your presentations uh, so that uh, we can get through them all. Um, so in case you don't know, we had a major astronomical event uh, last month. Uh, so we had a, solar, a total solar eclipse uh, that, uh, that crossed the, uh, the U.S. Uh, who was able to see the eclipse? All right. Uh, who saw just the partial? That's a good number. Totality? And uh, who missed it completely? <laughs> All right, just a couple. All right, for, for those of you that missed it, uh, worry not. We have you covered. There are plenty of, of observations. Uh, images and presentations regarding the, uh, the eclipse tonight, so you will get your fill. So to start off, we have uh, some of our usual programs with uh, Dave Chisholm giving uh, our Ottawa skies. Stefan Pape is going to give us an update on Astro Pontiac. Uh, Mike Mogadam is going to talk about the uh, solar eclipse event that was held here at the museum. Uh, we're going to have the break after that, depending on timing. That may change. We'll see how we're flying through the slides. Um, and then we're going to move into the exciting stuff. We're going to get to see uh, some of the observations and some of the presentations about the eclipse. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand the podium here to Dave. So I'm told uh, warp speed is appropriate. I will attempt to do that. Um, first of all, sorry about it. You missed the full moon. It was on the 6th. Mercury is, uh, is visible, the greatest western elongation is going to be on September the 12th, and you'll look for the planet low in the eastern sky just before sunrise. This is one of the few times you'll actually be able to, to, to see Mercury. Uh, Venus is uh, visible in the early morning sky all month. Mars is not visible, it's up during the daylight hours. Jupiter is visible all month, although it's pretty low in the sky right now, in the early evening. Saturn's in a great position for observing right now, and it's visible all month in the early evening. Uranus is visible all month, as is Neptune. Best uh, viewing time for the International Space Station. It comes across many times, but this is when it's higher in the sky. Uh, 6.11 a.m. on September the 15th. There's a path across the sky. There's our two cartoons, characters of the month. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave, for that. Uh, and hopefully all of you that saw the eclipse were being a little safer than, uh, than Mr. Trump there. All right. So next on the program, we've got Stefan. He's going to give us a quick update uh, on, on, on the uh, uh, Pontiac Observatory. Or planetarium. Please come up. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for having me this evening. Um, so, uh, for th I've I've been here and had a chance to uh, talk about our project a couple times before, but um, just to give a quick recap, our uh, our aim is to develop an astronomy park in the Pontiac region of West Quebec. Uh, the main components are a portable planetarium, a uh, sky shed uh, style roll off roof observatory, and offer a selection of telescopes. And uh, the, and the uh, planetarium is interesting because, you know, we'll be using it at the site and also in schools as sort of like a, a fundraising activity because that, um, that would allow us to pay for the maintenance of the site and everything like that, but also in the community for uh, sort of like um, outreach events. And so uh, one of the big things I'd really like to do is to be able to uh, lend it out to, you know, uh, members of the RASC who want to do uh, outreach events and also members of the Regroupement des Astronomes Amateurs de l'Outaouais Québécois as uh, both groups have helped us so much in our efforts in publicity and also for um, doing uh, astronomy observing. Our, our uh, 
big fundraising campaign actually started uh, with a solar observing uh, that, was, uh, that was supported by the um, uh, RASC uh, a few years ago. And so uh, basically in 2013, that's when uh, we started our big public outreach with a uh, event in Aylmer that featured Mark Garneau and also uh, display, uh, displays from the RAAOQ and the RASC, the Canadian Space Society. In 2014 is when we started with our fundraising. Um, 2015, we were able to uh, uh, work with the National Capital Commission to secure a site in uh, Gatineau Park at the Luskville Falls entrance, uh, which helps us in terms of uh, in terms of publicizing our events and also uh, complements uh, what uh, the Gatineau Park management is trying to do with the site uh, in terms of having contemplative uh, activities for uh, guests to Gatineau Park in that area. And they cleared up a beautiful site for us. Uh, it's the farm and then they actually cleared the tree line once uh, the, the migratory birds had left for the season and so we have a great view of the southern sky. And uh, also in 2016 was a big year for us because uh, that was when the funding finally came together for us to be able to offer the elements that I showed earlier. So uh, we'll be having um, some observations at the site. Uh, we haven't started construction yet but we'll be having uh, free public viewings uh, the weekends of September 15th and 22nd and October 13th and 20th. And if anybody's interested in sharing views of the skies and, uh, and their telescopes with the public, it would be great to have you out. Details of the event are on astropontiac.ca. Uh, basically, Friday is the night that we hope to have them, and then the following Saturday would be uh, the backup uh, night if need be. Um, and it, the site offers a grassy field, so it would be dewy and you should wear uh, good boots uh, or waterproof shoes. It has basic facilities, uh, so, so uh, not washrooms, but there's uh, some park outhouses, and it's got decent parking. If you're there before sundown and you'd like to bring equipment on the field, they've put in a gate for us to open up and then we close it after sundown so that visitors don't drive out onto the field. So you can have access to set up your scopes. Uh, as I mentioned before, a good view of the southern horizon and we have uh, small but enthusiastic crowds. Uh, so our website again, astropontiac.ca and if you can make it, I know that you know, there's a lot of astronomy activities going on in the region, but if you'd like something different, it'd be great if you'd uh, come and check out one of our events. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Stephane. All right. So next, uh, we're going to be talking about, or we're going to have a couple talks about the uh, public outreach event that we had uh, here at the museum. Um, there are lots of volunteers, and my understanding is that there was unprecedented attendance to this event. So I'm not going to steal any more of Mike's thunder there, uh, so I'll let him uh, come up and speak to the event, and uh, we'll have a couple other speakers there speaking to, to it as well. Mike? Well, hi, everyone. I'm sure most of you, I, I'm betting that most of you are, uh, heard about what happened at the museum on the, uh, on the day of the uh, partial solar eclipse um, up here in, in Ottawa. It was, it was hard not to uh, hear, hear about it. Um, next slide, please. Well, I could do this, I guess. Even before we started, uh, there were long lineups. Um, I think there was a lot of people showing a lot of interest in the, in the Eclipse viewers that we, that we had. Uh, we had, um, we had uh, I think, altogether between ourselves and the museum, we must have had close to 2,000 of them. We gave them all out uh, shortly after noon. So the solar eclipse, as you know, started around, what, just after 1, 1 15, something like that. Uh, lineups went all the, way around the, um, all the way around the building here. Here's a panoramic shot that Chris put together. Um, we started to see crowds and, 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 and long lineups uh, very, very, quick, very, very quickly here. And it became apparent that you know, this, was, this was something that we didn't expect. It exceeded all of our, um, of our expectations. Um, the, we had, uh, we, we were set up just right outside the door here. We were set up on the hill just uh, outside and, and, uh, and people were coming from, 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 from everywhere. Um, we, it was, uh, I was one of those people actually. Um, it, it, 
initially, and I could see a building because I was actually, I, I came a little bit later myself. Um, the, um, uh, the Aviation Parkway, I, I was backed up to first to Montreal Road, then all the way to the Queensway. So, um, so that, you know, there's good and there's bad with that, but, the, but uh, it was an extremely popular event. And it actually said, and I've said this to um, a couple of people, it, it said that very, I, th I think that the Aviation and Space Museum is very quickly becoming a center of astronomy, a recognized center of astronomy in, 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 in Ottawa, which I think is a very, very good thing. Um, there were all sorts of uh, exhibits, various uh, uh, ideas here, and what you, what you can see in this slide here on the, on the fellow there is um, we, had, we had lots of, um, we had lots of um, a media that showed up. Uh, this, uh, this, this uh, lady was uh, interviewing these, uh, these two people here. Uh, you can see there was a CTV cameraman there. Uh, there. And what, what I found really nice about this event is that it wasn't just our telescopes we set up. There a lot, people brought all kinds of uh, pinhole cameras and project, various projection devices. And, and, and some of them were quite good, uh, um, as I'm sure you'll see in the, in the slide pack, uh, not just uh, what I'm sharing with you, but throughout this, this evening here. Um, the shady character on the left there, that's Al Scott. Um, it was actually, it was actually uh, really interesting here because um, I, didn't, I myself didn't bring my scope, but myself, Gary Boyle, Al Scott, uh, Jesse Rogerson from the museum, we all worked the crowds, okay? So it was kind of neat. So we were, you know, I, would, I had a couple of uh, Eclipse viewers that I went around and I shared them with people here. I answered questions and I could see that some telescope lineups were very short and others were long, so I went and I grabbed 15 people and said, well, you, you want to go into a shorter lineup? And they all sort of scurried, wondering, is he really with the museum here or so forth? But, <laughs> but um, they, they, they did join me, and, and uh, likewise, uh, uh, Al was with the, with the binoculars there, and, and, uh, and Gary, the same, same, same thing, and Jesse, and so on. Um, I've said it before, uh, Gary, we're very fortunate to have Gary Boyle in our center because Gary really worked the media. He, he, he was on a ton of different uh, uh, radio, TV stations. I got to believe that it was hard for you not to hear Gary all right, on the, uh, in, in the media. That plus what Jesse did with, in the museum, uh, the two of them were, in fact, when I was driving in, I heard Jesse Rogers from the, from the museum. He's, he's, an, he's an astronomer at the museum here and uh, a science advisor at the museum here. Um, real spark plug, by the way, as I'm sure you'll see. And um, between the... Uh, us and um, in the museum uh, staff, it was really uh, very well promoted here. Some shots of our friend Gary um, at the various uh, media outlets. And uh, this one, is this the video, Chris, or is it the next? No, it's the next one, I think. Um, this is um, Burris. What's his first name, Tom Burris? Henry, Henry Burris, how could I forget? Um, and. Uh, and I think this is the video, Chris. Is that right? If, if, no, it's the next one. Okay, thanks. Um, again, lots of lots of media coverage. This was really interesting because I mean, we, we, we there was actually a lot of live broadcast, several live broadcasts at the museum. And uh, just to give you sort of sort of a feel for those of you who weren't there, this is um, this is a, a short segment uh, of what, what it was all about. On this side of the border, Canadians were still part of the action, treated to a partial eclipse. In Ottawa, there was a 61% coverage at peak hour, a site that attracted thousands to a viewing party over at the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum. That's where CTV's Megan Shaw was for us all day. Megan? Well, Graham, this was a very well attended event, bigger than even organizers expected. There were so many people here that organizers actually ran out of the glasses that they were supposed to give to all of those people who all just wanted to look up in the sky and catch a glimpse. When the moon crept over the sun in Ottawa, spectators couldn't believe their eyes. Oh my God, I cannot believe it, so it's so clear. So, so red Oh wow, that is really nice. In the capital region, a partial eclipse was visible. At its peak, 61% of the sun was covered. The sun is here and the moon is coming in. Little Julia's first eclipse. It kind of looks like Pac-Man. <laughs> oh, wow. For others, a sequel. This is my second solar eclipse. The first one I saw in 1979 in Winnipeg. I was 19 years old. It was February and it was cold. This time around, a beautiful day, bringing out thousands to the Canada Aviation and Space Museum for a viewing party.
So I want to be part of history and I want to be with other people and we have like real astronomers. Manny came early to score the free protective glasses being handed out. You put them down here and then you look up. But with more and more families coming by the car load, organizers quickly ran out, forcing latecomers to line up for the telescopes. With this many people here to see half of the sun covered by the moon, just wait until 2024 when our viewing region will be treated to a total solar eclipse. It's going to be a full eclipse coming up the St. Lawrence Seaway. So if you're in the Kingston, Cornwall, Brockville, Montreal area, even Toronto, uh, they will get the full effect. Up here we'll get uh, quite a bit of darkness. The excitement already building around this event, a pleasant sign for astronomy lovers. Anything that, for, for our point of view, that gets people looking up at the skies is bonus for us. And before this partial eclipse was even over, the countdown in the capital was on for the upcoming full eclipse. That'll be just awesome. That's, that's even better. She's kind of been hyped up by her papa. I'm already uh, going to schedule myself for that date. Now the eclipse here lasted about two hours and there were a lot of questions about it. Now if you were outside during that time, that's okay. There was a little bit of concern, but experts tell me it's just like any other day. The reason that they tell you not to look up at the sun is because, well, we shouldn't look up at the sun any other day, either without wearing those protective glasses. Graham. All right, CTV's Megan Shaw reporting live for us. We heard they were backed up all the way to Montreal Road. Uh, quite an event, the aviation and space. So um, as I was mentioning, the, the, the crowds were far, far exceeded what we ex expected. We had tremendous media coverage. And I have to say, I, I really think that our, our center shined in, fr in front of the, uh, not just the media, but just in, in front of, the, of, 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 of everyone. Uh, obviously, you saw uh, sev several of our members in that video. Uh, Julia our, uh, Webster, our, uh, our superstar, uh, she, she, was, she figured prominently. Um, Chris, a, it was a big driving force, by the way, behind this, this event at the, uh, at the museum, did a ton of organizing, so um, a lot of the success ar arises because of the work that Chris did. Um, we want to say special thanks to all the volunteers that contributed to this. Um, and again, Chris did, did it a lot. And I also wanted to thank, uh, yeah, that's for sure. I also wanted to thank Jesse Rogerson at, uh, at the museum because um, I think we got a terrific par uh, partnership with the museum here. An event like this wouldn't happen without uh, a great collaboration. So, Jesse, I look forward to doing a lot more with you. Okay, thanks so much. I think that's it. Oh, oh yes, of course. Um, so, uh, we, we checked. We checked uh, I, I just before this meeting, I checked at Tilladanko's uh, clear sky chart. April 8, 2024 is looking good. Clear skies, transparent. <laughs> Transparent skies. Um, so that's that's. I, I think uh, we can declare a go. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, so Jesse from the museum here is just going to give us a couple words. Uh, so Jesse, please come on up. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, hi. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, I just wanted to give like a couple of words because it was unbelievable. The event was amazing. Um, it, 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 uh, he said, Mike was saying how it wouldn't have happened without me here, but it wouldn't have happened without any of you here. Not even close would have happened to, um, without your help. So um, I want to like sort of back up about a week or two, a week and a half before the event. Uh, Mike, Chris, and Tim? Was it Tim? Uh, we, yeah, uh, we all sat down at a Tim's just to plan out the, the nitty gritty details. Um, and then at the end of the meeting, we were like, okay, so like, let's, let's project here. How many do you think we're really going to get? And I was like, I don't know, like 500, 1,000 maybe. And, and uh, I think Chris and Tim were saying like 1,500, maybe 1,500. And then Tim was like, oh no, Mike. Mike, I think you said something like 2,000 maybe, right? That's right. Yeah. And our final, now these are the numbers that the museum is, is claiming. The official number is 5,000 um, came, but most people are saying upwards of six or 7,000 uh, attended the event. Now, I, that whole backup to Montreal, to Ogilvy, and even further to the Queensway scared the crap out of me. I've been working here for six months, right? And I put this, I put this together with the help of, of you all, and, and then they, the, it gets backed up. The, Lobby is packed. Everything's just crazy. 
everybody was having a great time, but it was packed. And then the, the police came in, right? The, uh, the, the RCMP gets called to deal with traffic. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is great. Good job, Jesse. You know, you're going to get fired. Um, so have any of you met um, uh, Eric Bisson? Um, I don't know if any of you have. He's uh, the lead security for all three museums for us. And he, his off base of operations is here. And so I came in the next morning, and he's a, he's like a, he's a security guy. You know, he's a bald guy. He's big. He has, drives a big truck. He's, he's formidable. And he came in the next day, and I was like, oh, God. Because he got call after call after call from RCMP, wondering why the hell, sorry, we had blocked all their roads. And he came up to me, slapped me on the back, shook my hand, and said, that was the best thing we've done in a long time. <laughs> And I went, whew. <laughs> so it was amazing. It was crazy, but it was a good crazy. And so thank you very much for everything. And I'm going to enjoy looking at the pictures just as much as you, because I don't have any. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Jesse, for those words. And, and thank you to all the volunteers that, that were here at the museum and at other uh, events in, in other communities that uh, it's, it's great that we're sharing our passion for astronomy with, with the general public. So just a hand for the volunteers again. All right, let's keep this train moving. I don't know if I agree with this decision. Uh, Dave? All right, so it looks like Dave just has some pictures of the event. So we'll just uh, flip through them there. You can see lots of crowd, big crowd here. All right. Uh, Doug? Sure. Karen? That is an awesome shot. Uh, Martin? That's a beautiful shot. <laughs> it's a. Yeah, I think Chris is going to play it there. Yes, that's great. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think we're gonna we're gonna continue through. Uh, we'll move the break till around nine-ish. Um, so we're gonna get into some of the observation reports here. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, observations that came from the partial uh, eclipse. So if if the guys that are the guys and gals that are giving um, observations, if you guys can just get ready to, to come up to the podium, and we'll start with Tim Campbell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this this advances the slide. Okay. Uh, it goes back, yeah. and if you need a laser pointer, it's the top button. Don't touch the bottom button, because oh. the world Bad things explode. happen. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. I'm a rather new face here, so uh, hello to everyone. Um, we, uh, I, I work in Nepean on Colonnade Road, and I decided to spread the love, so I took my scopes to work. 
and uh, load them up in my uh, Volkswagen and brought them out into the soccer field behind my laboratory. And uh, a colleague helped me set up. I brought my 15-year-old uh, Skywatcher 6-inch Dob and my little ETX-80, set them up uh, with solar filters, and uh, everybody was extremely appreciative. Uh, they had just walked out with their own homemade contraptions and whatnot. So uh, we were able to uh, get some nice, uh, nice shots. I just used the, uh, the moon filter on my uh, daub, and I put some uh, beta film underneath the, uh, the open uh, hole, and it worked like a charm. Everybody was thoroughly impressed. It, it required a lot of uh, manual manipulation, but the, uh, the ETX tracked the uh, sun while locked onto the moon perfectly. That's me, apparently wearing the same shirt I am now. <laughs> um, this box over here was some garbage I found in our foyer, and I turned it into a pinhole camera in five minutes. Uh, and a uh, pair of glasses from the Venus Transit in 2012 that I got from the, uh, the other museum, which hopefully will open in a couple months. And uh, a lot of really happy campers, my better half. She came, uh, trekked across the city to join us. So did some little projections. And uh, yeah, so we had a great time. That's it. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, next we've got, oh, I guess you still have a couple more slides there. All right, Stephen. Uh, well, this actually, uh, good evening. This actually isn't the eclipse event. This was supposed to be under just general observations. This is just, uh, Brian McCullough um, was over at a party at my place just after the eclipse, but I just wanted to prove that get a couple of astronomers together, you still take a look at the sky even no matter what's going on. So we managed to find Saturn up there. Uh, Laser point is the top button. Well, it's, it's marked. It's there. People can see it. <laughs> I'm looking more for the... Oh, uh, you can advance the slide at this button. Advance the slides. Okay. So, back to the eclipse world. Um, it started out with, let's invite a couple of the neighbor kids over for, uh, for the eclipse. Well, then it grew to, well, we got some other friends with kids, and then the parents started showing up, and then another invite went out, and Suzanne and I looked at each other and said, oh, crap, we're having a party. Uh, which it did turn out into a good party. We threw the kids in the pool during part, and slowly the grass behind the telescopes got wetter and wetter as they'd come out of the pool, take a look, go back in the pool, and some adult beverages went on. But anyway, what I was pleased to see is, is if you take a look down here, this pinhole camera I didn't make, they showed up with pinhole cameras. They were really, really interested. They were pumped. We had uh, reports of, of kids getting up early because it was eclipse day and making sure it was, it was really good to see the enthusiasm. We had a good, uh, good setup. We had a um, uh, small uh, uh, Questar here with a solar filter doing visual. Uh, the C8 was doing um, uh, a camera and there was a computer in the box there. You can, uh, you can see it. We had a whole bunch of friends, and uh, oh, we had some eyepiece projection or binocular projection going on. Uh, we did have some glasses, so there was a whole selection of things that uh, that the people were enjoying. Uh, you can barely make it out there doing the uh, the video. This actually worked really, really well for showing um, uh, things going on, uh, although people were taking. Uh, eyepiece uh, pictures with their cell phones and really doing a spectacular job on, on some of them. It was quite surprising how well some turned out. And then this is just a shot with a, with a nice little bit of sunspot there that I took uh, at the end. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Dave? Great, thank you. You can advance the slide with the button on the right there. Button on the right, okay. Um, this, uh, this eclipse is something I was looking forward to for a number of years. The last time I saw an eclipse, I think, was 94. It was an annular eclipse, partial annular eclipse here. And uh, so I thought, this is it. So I started planning months ago. And I considered coming out to uh, the Aviation Museum to, uh, to take part. And I thought, 
I want to do some, uh, I want to do a time lapse. I have to polar align the night before. So I decided, no, I can't come to this. So to, to do this, um, to make a very long story short, I figured that I had to have taken close to 900 pictures. Every 10 seconds for about two and a half hours, and then uh, a lot of post-production work with that. So I'd like to share with you uh, the length of the eclipse uh, in about 43 seconds. I'm not sure if it's advancing here, Chris. Yeah, you'll have to. While this is going on too, um, I had some, uh, some scientific questions. I'm a science teacher and I wanted to have, uh, I wanted to see if you can notice a t change in temperature and a change in humidity here in Ottawa. Yeah, I'll just talk through it while you're doing this. So I've got some slides afterwards showing uh, uh, some data, uh, temperature uh, versus time, humidity versus time for, uh, for Ottawa. And I was quite surprised that you can actually see and feel that, uh, that little dip. So here we go. There's a little bit of a glitch in it because I had a power failure and uh, some camera problems. But uh, I was quite impressed with the, uh, with the results. And I've got this, uh, the, uh, the Laws Mandy mount on, uh, on solar tracking, not lunar tracking. So that's why it looks like the moon's coming across. And the glitch is about to happen right about now. So for those that did not see the eclipse, my students just were in, enthralled by this. And uh, it really puts things in a nice perspective. So that was the... Uh, thank you. So that was the, the time lapse and a lot of uh, uh, post-production work had to go into that. But here's the thing that I found very interesting and that's uh, when you take a look at the time of the eclipse, you can actually see that dip in temperature. At uh, 1.15 it started, so right about here, no wait a second, that's, uh, that doesn't make sense. Oh sorry, 13, yeah right about here. You can see there's, there's the dip in the temperature. And uh, I didn't expect to see that as much as, uh, as uh, what, uh, what came up, as well as an increase in the humidity. So you can see the humidity as the, temperature, as the day goes along. That makes sense. It drops off. But as the temperature goes down, the humidity should go up. And that's something I found very interesting about the eclipse. One other observation I just wanted to throw at you was, I don't know if you noticed that the sky color was particularly eerie that day. It was a grayish red. And I threw this at my students uh, when we came back to school this week. And um, they said, well, what, I asked them, what else is going on? Uh, what else affects the atmosphere? And one kid goes, I know what it is! Forest fires! That's it! And I'm pretty sure that's the reason why we had that grayish red sky. And I'd like to uh, present another little talk later on. Um, because I've been doing some astrophotography lately and anyone who's been doing astrophotography knows those reds are not coming through in your camera. So there's a reason for that and we might have to wait till winter time for things to settle down. Anyways, that's all that I have, so thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dave. All right, Richard Taylor. Yeah, this is also a video, so you're going to have to go through the video process again. You can advance the slide with that. No. All right. Chris, can you kill Chris, the video? Chris, please. <laughs> okay. This is a, that was a very hard act to follow. I've got another time lapse here, and it's nowhere near as good. But uh, I would like to say a big thank you to Brian McCullough, who uh, put me in connection with a donor who gave me this telescope that I used for this. It's a Celestron Next Star. And he gave it to me so that I, as a teacher, <laughs> could show off things to my, my students. So that's what I've made, and I've already put it up on our school uh, bulletin board. And so we'll be teaching astronomy to the students with this as an example right now. It's nowhere near as uh, smooth as the other one, two and a half minutes between exposures, and manually adjusted to line them all up, because I didn't have a good tracking thing. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Sorry, Chris. Uh, 
Is it not closing? Yeah, Bob. We'll see. We'll get it back to presentation mode. Are you going to advance these or yeah, am I frozen? <laughs> this is my uh, four year old granddaughter uh, in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, where I observed the eclipse. It, this is the, outside their parking lot in the co at the condo they live at. And they, um, as people wandered by, I, I, I reeled them in like some kind of salesman. Uh, she uh, actually knew the moon was going in front of the sun before I did not tell her that, so it must have been mentioned in class. And her mother was positive I was going to burn her eyes out. Uh, this is uh, some of my family observing this. Uh, we, uh, I probably reeled in about 60 people during the time, including uh, one young man who was standing about 100 meters away looking at the sun through uh, uh, two sunglasses uh, as protection. <laughs> Did not burn his eyes out that I know about, but uh, I brought him over and showed him the proper way of seeing it. Uh, you can see my camera set up there. It's just a, it's just a DSLR with a camera lens on it, and, and I took... Um, an image every three and a half minutes, except sometimes it was a minute, sometimes it was five minutes. It was just a random for the two and a half hours. And so I don't know if this will show anything or not. Are you on, Rich? Are you on there, Mike or Chris? I'm sorry. Yeah. Now you have to remember this is a uh, not a tracking machine. It's just a camera that I manually pointed at the sun every once in a while. So it's pretty. And also the pictures are not. Um, in, uh, taking a, they're taking at different intervals. But we had 71% coverage. My wife wanted me to mention that this was her birthday on the eclipse day. <laughs> she was four, and this is why I'm in Saskatoon instead of like Nevada. <laughs> uh, you will notice that I am actually looking through a pair of binoculars. And so everybody who showed up, about 60 people, including a guy cutting the grass and a FedEx guy, driving by, uh, got to look through the, just the, the, the screens and the, uh, the binoculars. Uh, and this is a little video clip I took of it, hopefully. You know, everybody who looked at it through the binoculars, we saw the sunspots and was fascinated by that part about it. The skies were crystal clear. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the weather like in, Sa in Saskatoon usually in, in that time of the year, but boy, it was just like a, a crystal deep blue sky. You couldn't have asked for a better day except maybe with a better computer. <laughs> That's right. What's really, what's really sad is this video clip is not that great. Rural activity is quite high uh, this evening. Uh, there was a couple flares yesterday and the day before, so there's a good chance of auroras if you know if we ever get clear skies around here. Uh, so make sure you're looking up and you're looking north uh, after the meeting tonight. You might be able to see something, uh, and also probably tomorrow and the day after uh, we'll have. Good oh, there you go. How are we doing, Chris? No pressure. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> so I'm curious, uh, what what kind of distances did people travel for the for the eclipse? Um, who traveled more than 2,500 kilometers? I did. It's, it's, it's sort of up. It's, it was implied in the question. <laughs> uh, who traveled uh, more than 1,000 kilometers? I guess that's, that would also be the 2,500 people. Yeah, all right. Can you tell I'm trying to fill the, uh, the empty space? <laughs> okay. All right, are we good to go? Okay, thanks everyone. Bob, sorry again. Yep. You'll notice it's a little bit more coverage than around here. But not, not a ton more. And I actually didn't notice any darkening at all of this ground. Uh, I, I'm sure there had to be some, but it, uh, my eyes adjusted as quickly as that. Okay, after the eclipse, I drove about two hours east of there to a little town, western a town called Winyard in Saskatchewan, and I thought to myself, Wait a second, we've just had a, 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 a you know, a, a eclipse of the, uh, of the sun, and uh, I wonder if I could see the moon that day. You know, just as the sun set, could I see, see like an eight-hour new moon? Is that even possible? I didn't know. So I ran out to Quill Lake, and the sun was setting on this uh, potash mine. This potash mine is 40 kilometers away. Shows you two things. Potash mines are really big. And the prairies are freaking flat. <laughs> so un unfortunately, unfortunately, the sun and the moon are setting almost together. The moon is lagging a little bit behind, but they don't set at the same spot. They kind of go down together. They've separated a bit, and they're heading down together. It would be a couple of, maybe five or six uh, diameters away. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be neat? So I just waited to the appropriate time, and the sky is like blood red. Uh, and obviously over the whole frame. And of course, like they were burning down half of British Columbia. So we just, all I got was great picture of smoke. Except this fly, flight of geese through, through, flew through the picture. That was the only interesting thing that happened. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, and sorry for the interruptions there. Hopefully we've got uh, technical issues sorted out. All right, uh, Rob. Uh, you advance the slide to the back. This one. Uh, I've only got one. So I put everything on one slide so I don't have to worry about technology. Um, <laughs> most people buy telescopes. I build one, so that's my 12 and a half inch. And uh, that built when I was just first year uh, university. So it was quite a hard job to do. So hard I had to get somebody to finish it and fix what I broke. But one nice interesting thing is adolescents, they're very jaded. And my son is, is one of those. And it's very difficult to, especially when he's nocturnal, he, he's up during the day at nighttime and he sleeps all day. So here's a solar eclipse in the middle of the day. And he actually got up and he got his camera. He's got far better gear than I do. So he put it on my t telescope and then stayed up for the entire eclipse in and out to, to get water and so on to cool off and, and do some more... Uh, some more video games, and then finally it, it, it ended. But he did take, so this is the first time he's ever seen a solar eclipse. In fact, this is the first time he's ever really uh, done anything in astronomy except take a few pictures when I cajole him to put a camera on, on this telescope. And you can see it actually worked out quite well, but the modern technology is such that these cameras are almost foolproof. Um, the, the fool comes when you have to pay for them because they're very expensive. <laughs> but this one, you know, it does all kinds of things to tell you when you're exactly in focus. So as a result, he was in focus. Uh, the ones that I did before he put his camera on are terribly blurry, so I decided to, to put them in the, uh, the waste bin, trash bin on my, my laptop. But you can see the, the, the setup we had, and where's the, uh, here's the light. 
So first of all, um, he needed a new lens, so he bought a new lens, and with the lens came an old camera. The guy gave it away with his lens. And so it's, it's actually a really good camera if you're back in 2001. But I was able to do the video. It's still sitting on the tape. We'll see what happens to that. Uh, binoculars, 11 by 80s with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the solar, with the uh, sun's filter on it. I've had this material for literally seven years. And I finally got around to making uh, filters out of it. And in particular, the, uh, this is a 12 and a half inch f4, and it's working at about f11.1. And hence, it also makes it easier to focus. But it was seemed to be, that's about the sweet spot when it comes to focal ratios when you're going for, for contrast. And in the lower left, you can see, essentially his setup with his uh, Shogun display and so on, and a little tiny display on his camera. Remarkably good. And of course, one interesting thing about the eclipse is what makes light different. And during a solar eclipse, you essentially have a crescent. So there's a large dimension here, a sm relatively small dimension here. The small dimension makes it more like a sharp light, so the shadows are, are sharp. And here the shadows are result in being very fuzzy. So you can see the asymmetrical shadow when you take a picture of your face over your son's pizza box. <laughs> so that's all I have to say about this one. It was great to get him out, and he actually is thinking about uh, 2024. So that's kind of neat. In fact, maybe even earlier. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Stephen Montgomery. So I'm fairly new at trying to do things and didn't have much time to prepare, sort of left work, came home, threw the stuff up, and more or less went out every five, well, took a picture every five minutes and made a little GIF up. So Chris, you're doing the, or do I? Okay. Took a couple more shots closer together at the end. Okay. We had one family driving by and they seen the telescope stopped and looked through. They said they were planning to come to the museum. I think they probably lucked out stopping at my place. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, Stephen. Hugo? Okay, which one's forward? Uh, this one goes forward, okay. and the laser pointer if you need it. Okay. Um, you wonder how I ended up with this uh, device? It's. Uh, I was going to use my regular telescope and set up uh, the projection screen and so on, but. Uh, I didn't plan ahead, so uh, when I went to get it, I found I didn't have any eyepieces. So I wondered what had happened to them. So I thought maybe I had uh, accidentally taken them downstairs to the basement uh, when I was cleaning up. So when I went down to the basement, uh, in the corner, far corner, I found this little contraption, which was just a pipe, and uh, a few other odds and ends. And I thought, well, that might do. Now, one thing that you immediately discover is, okay, if you're going to project it, you should really have a little bit of a shade there. But as soon as you put the shade on, you, you don't see the shadow of the telescope, so you no longer have that easy um, orientation where you can just minimize the shadow and there you got the sun. So it, it's a little bit of hit and miss there. Um, anyway, this contra little contraption I made when I was in public school. And it's a wonder I still have it. Anyway, it's just a piece of old pipe that I found in my dad's basement. And I recall ordering some simple lenses of a mail order somewhere in the States. And I put this thing together. There's, uh, the eyepiece is held by a half a spool, uh, a spool, a spool, yeah, half a spool there. And as you can see, it's a little altazimuth mount there. Crudely made with, uh, you know, a kid uh, using the, his uh, whatever he can find in his basement, the tools. And of course, back in those days, it wasn't like now, no parent hovering over you uh, 
telling you what you should or shouldn't do. So it was all uh, go to it and do whatever you can. So anyway, I'm amazed it was there. And uh, obviously, I thought, well, that should be good enough. For since it's not a total eclipse, uh, well, it's not going to be that fancy. So anyway, as you can see uh, in the shadow box, you can see the little uh, crescent there, and you can see the next generation is uh, enjoying some of this. Now, I was curious, okay, how does a pinhole camera work? Maybe, maybe that'll be... I wasn't sure that you could get a good image with the pinhole camera in terms of the crescent. So I thought, okay, I'll get a little piece of uh, uh, cardboard and punch a few holes in it. So I used a real high-tech device to punch the holes. You know these, uh, when you're eating corn, you have these things to hold the corn with, and it's got pins in it. Well, I found those in my drawer, and uh, wouldn't you know it, they're very round and very sharp, so they worked very well. So I punched six holes there, and uh, as you can see, it's not a bad image. And I, I had my son hold uh, just the two pieces of paper there, and I took a photo. Now, um, in conclusion, uh, from last uh, meeting, I, I got a couple of these uh, solar glasses from, uh, from the club here, and I gave uh, one to uh, a friend of mine who was going to Toronto on a train that day, and she remembered uh, that the solar eclipse was on uh, around that time when she was on a train, so she looked out the window and used these things. The next thing you knew, her neighbor wanted to try it, and after a while, the whole train car, they were all looking using these one set of uh, glasses that we got from here. So that's a surprise outreach to me. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. All right. Uh, next, we've got Martin Viala. We, I passed by his, uh, his slides at the beginning of the meeting there, so he's gonna, he has a couple things to speak to. Martin, thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Martin. Uh, I'm interested in astronomy since uh, I'm young. I was uh, very interested by deep sky object, but since uh, I live in the city and I'm so annoyed by light pollution, I decided to look at the strongest source of light pollution uh, during the day, the sun. So um, I got my, myself a small solar telescope and uh, I was hoping to, to do a time lapse during uh, the event. So I brought my, the small telescope, uh, wonky tripod, my Mac, and I, I plugged the camera on the scope and on the computer. And I was recording one picture per minute, but since I was not very really polar aligned, uh, the, the sun was drifting out of the frame, so I had to manually every two minutes to recenter the sun in the frame. It was a, a real pain. But a lot of people showed up and uh, looked at the screen, uh, borrowed my uh, solar glasses. I met a lot of people. It was very cool. So I was able to get uh, to do this time lapse. Uh, I want you to pay attention to the small sunspot on the lower uh, left, because it, it actually uh, kind of bursts a little, kind of little uh, solar flare. And. Yep, just right. Just there. Thank you. Can we see that again? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Cool. Well done, Martin. And uh, hopefully we get to see more of your stuff in the future. All right. Um, oops. So I think we're going to get uh, Majid Naji up uh, and, uh, and Tim for a second. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, this is Majid. I'm uh, also from NRC. So uh, we had an event also in NRC. Unfortunately, it was my fault to send uh, a report on time. So we had a very nice event at there. More than uh, something like 60, 50 uh, people attended our events. And to hold that event, we received lots of uh, 
had from uh, ROSC. We should appreciate ROSC because we received uh, good numbers of the, the, those uh, just a solar viewer from ROSC and we distributed among all uh, colleagues. Even we needed more even at the end, we realized, okay, we had to share all of them because it was not even. We too. Yeah, we had something <laughs> like 60, 70 and it was not enough. I, we were very happy. So it was one of our biggest, uh, let's say, O2 event in the year. So Excellent. Uh, uh, we have a, one appreciation letter from our director in NRC to appreciate Ross for helping us for uh, having a, or for organizing this uh, solar event. And we, we, we wish it possible to have same events, maybe some astronomical event in, in NRC because after we sent an email to everyone and we asked them, okay, what's your idea to having another astronomical something like night observation event? And we received lots of email from colleagues. All colleagues shows that, okay, we would like, we would like to have uh, such kind of the interesting big event again. And so I should appreciate uh, uh, Rosk and in, uh, in the say behind of the thank NRC, you. we have an appreciation letter for you. And thank you very much. Well, thank you for uh, a lovely gesture. And we're delighted to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also should, uh, should uh, mention the name of Mike, because Mike also helped us a lot. And thank you very much, Mike, also, for all arrangements and helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Majid. Uh, thank you very much. All right. So next we're going to have our uh, observation reports for total eclipse observations. Uh, so if the presenters could just make themselves ready here at the, the side of the stage, I'd be appreciated. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Ron Clough. So you can advance the, uh, with, uh, with that button there, you advance the slides. Thanks. Hi, um, this is my first eclipse. Uh, I drove to uh, Madisonville, Kentucky, and they had a, whoops, what did I touch? Oh, <laughs> oh it's a video situation, so oh. Chris will play the video for you. No, there's no video. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. Um, yeah, so they, it's a small town, they had a beautiful park. Oh, sir, can you speak into the mic there? If you stand oh. right behind the podium and into the mic. Yeah, so Madisonville, Kentucky, they have a beautiful park. Uh, this is where we were. So this is um, my first eclipse. So anything I read said, don't try to do anything fancy, just enjoy it. So I almost complied. I took three photos. Um, this one before the eclipse. And uh, this one during the totality, just to show how dark it was. Uh, these are both taken with an, an iPad, so nothing fancy. Um, and then... This is the ground be beneath a tree, so you know you get the pinhole effect, the light that makes it through the leaves, uh, so it shows the uh, crescents. Another interesting thing that happened was um, uh, it was about 38 degrees when we arrived. Uh, we were under a big tree. Uh, the cicadas were very loud, but when totality happened, they stopped and the uh, katydid started up. So it was kind of neat that way. Anyway, um, 20, 2024 can't get here soon enough for me. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Uh, Doug. So Mercedes and I went to uh, Salem, Oregon, and we flew via Vancouver and down, down to Portland, and we're flying along, and Mercedes is looking out the window and says, oh, volcano. I go, Volcano? Is it like Bound St. Helens? So I handed her my phone and she snapped this picture out the window. Wow. Isn't that gorgeous? That's amazing. <laughs> That's not amazing. It's astounding. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank her. <laughs> so this is the first time I've ever done a selfie. I'm not... <laughs> but I wanted to show my equipment here. Um, this is a telescope. This actually traveled with us to uh, Libya for the eclipse uh, back in 2006. And uh, it actually took four suitcases to bring the thing along. And I was thinking, there must be some way to reduce the bulk and weight of this thing for this trip. And I was talking to Mercedes about maybe making a little, like, limited motion uh, declination axis. And, and she said, wedge. And I thought, wedge? Oh, we know the declination of the sun. So I machined up a 12-degree wedge and replaced my entire declination axis of that little tiny piece of metal. And it knocked, like, half the weight out of the whole assembly. Um, made it much more portable. And uh, so we only had a couple of bags. 
which is great. Um, and then if I wanted to adjust the telescope up and down, I just used the polar alignment, and that actually made the polar alignment better by doing that, so it actually worked out really well. So there's a great tip if you're traveling. A few minutes, in a, a couple hours in a machine shop makes up for a lot of carrying. Um, yeah, partial eclipse. I didn't bother with all the other partial phases because I knew you'd see all of them already. Um, so let's just jump into totality then. Oh, wait, we're not quite. I also did a picture of uh, tree shadows on the sidewalk. Um, beautiful crescents. And now, so this is, a, um, this is actually the sum of 10 one thousandths of a second exposures. Um, and I've adjusted it to show the prominences. Well, they weren't really huge in this eclipse, but they're nice and bright red and very beautiful. And then the next shot's adjusted, this is the same picture, is adjusted to show you the corona. This is a very, very gorgeous eclipse. I mean, no picture will ever do it justice. You really have to see this in person. It has this um, translucent effect to it, and you can also see the prominences and the uh, corona at the same time with your eye, which you can't really do on a computer screen. Uh, but you can see the poles of the sun have field lines like a bar magnet, and then there's these big things sticking out everywhere else. Um, fairly typical of a more of a solar minimum eclipse than a solar maximum eclipse. We're going down towards the bottom right now. So, um, that's, that's all I'm going to show for today. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Doug. Those are some remarkable images. All right, uh, Tom. Doug stole my thunder. <laughs> Actually, this is a, a stack of three images combined in Maxim DL, and I did some uh, unsharp masking to try to bring out the feathery texture of the corona. So that's why there's some noise in the image. Oh, I guess I only have the one image there. Oh, similar Im image. Again, you can see the faint prominences around the outer, outer edge of the sun and uh, the inner corona. It's hard to combine those into one single image without layering the images in Photoshop or something, which I don't know how to do. So, this was taken from Glendo, Wyoming, 4,000 kilometers one direction. <laughs> Long drive. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. All right, uh, Hugo. Nope. All right, maybe we'll just uh, flip through his images there. Well, I guess is there a video, uh, Chris? Thanks for the submission, uh, Hugo, if you're watching online or if you watch it later. Taras? Hi, so uh, we traveled to Casper, Wyoming, with uh, Eric, Andrew, uh, Oscar, Paul, uh, other guys. So this was uh, uh, taken um, on the approach uh, with my 8-inch uh, scope and the solar filter. Um, the uh, oops, as you see, the uh, moon is approaching this way, and uh, uh, we were able to see the uh, spots 
that they, actually there were three more over here, but this particular picture uh, it was taken when uh, the moon was already covering them. Um, I was happy with this picture because you can see lots of the details. You can see umbra, uh, penumbra, um, the white uh, spots called, if I'm not mistaken, uh, faculae. So those are the details which uh, were on the sun that day. It was pretty amazing by itself. Uh, the air quality was not too good and there were clouds, so it chose one of the best pictures with... Uh, the, the rough edge on the edge of the moon, would they be the mountains on the moon? Yes, they will be. And this is the craters, the right. So you see it's not a rough edge on the sun, but on the moon, you see the rough edge. Exactly. The That's correct. So when the moon is approaching this way, oops, ouch. This um, mountains later on, when they touch this edge, because of the irregularities, they create something called Bailey's beads. So the little dips, ditches, and uh, spikes create a special pattern, which allows you to see um, a pattern like this. So it's very last few seconds before the totality, when the light has opportunity to get through those ridges. So this visual image is... Uh, how uh, we could perceive the last moments as, as, as the beads because of the uh, lunar landscape. Oops. You can see a little bit here how the ridges and valleys create these patterns of light called um, Bailey's beads. Now, this was so overwhelming experience, so impressive for me that when the totality started, I forgot about everything. I look at the sky and there's this dark black sun which normally is quite the opposite, with a huge corona around it, which is pretty bright. So I was so impressed that I forgot to do some important thing, which is take the solar filter out of my scope and take the uh, corona picture. I was taking the pictures, wondering what's going on, why they are so dark, so increased exposure and so on. So those few which were taken that way turned out to be like this with... Uh, uh, I believe this is photosphere and the prominence is showing up. Uh, it looks a little bit more contrast on the screen, but uh, uh, on the computer screen there is a nice red color showing here, there, and there. And yes, it's a bit noisy, but you can still see how the uh, close-up of the photosphere looks like. And uh, uh, the next step, so after totality, when uh, the moon continues, to move and opens the opposite side of, um, uh, of the sun. It's the opposite than the light coming through the ridges and uh, valleys, opening a very, very small and tiny part of uh, sun, which creates this effect called diamond ring, which is, again, you can see the uh, photosphere prominences here, but the first lights of sun, that very narrow, um, uh, crescent creates this uh, impression of a diamond ring. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tara. All right, uh, Howard? No? Okay. So we'll just uh, flip through the images. So it's interesting, you can see, I believe this is Regulus there. Uh, John Thompson? No. Nope. Maybe he left? All right, let's uh, I'll flip through his images as well. Oh, I guess it's a video. Sure. All right, uh, Shinya? Uh, this is next slide. Next slide, okay. Hi, uh, I'm Shinya Sato, and uh, I went to the city called Idaho Falls, and it's just about a four-hour drive from the Salt Lake City. And uh, actually, the, in June, uh, yeah, in June, I started uh, looking at the hotels in the 
Ida Falls, but I couldn't find anything except for that uh, very expensive rooms, like uh, you know, eight, what, 800 bucks per night, something like that. <laughs> and, but I, fortunately, I found uh, some uh, one hotels um, just in the city called Pocatero. It's uh, just uh, you know, maybe one hour, one hour drive uh, between the Ida Falls and uh, the Pocatero. So I went to the Ida Falls, and uh, so that's actually cameras I used for the observation. I just used uh, two cameras, uh, one with a small telescope and uh, called Mini Borg, and uh, to have a more relatively large uh, sun in my frame. And uh, the other one is uh, just a fixed uh, camera with a uh, wide angle. So this is actually the uh, sequence of the uh, solar eclipse. And uh, actually that eclipse Eclipse just started, uh, started at 10.15 and ended uh, 12.58. And the totality lasted about uh, for one minute, uh, 50 seconds uh, in, that, uh, in this area. So this is uh, just corona and uh, I could capture some and, uh, solar prominence. And uh, so this is actually the picture and uh, this <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was really dark and very, very impressive, and uh, it was great experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shinya. Okay, next we've got uh, Jim Thompson. Uh, next slide's on the right. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, as it seems like half of this group did, um, I made for Casper, Wyoming for Eclipse Day. I didn't see any of you guys there, so I don't know where you were. But. You were looking up. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Probably right. Uh, so, I, I made a trip out of this. I took my whole family. Uh, we rented a uh, camper van. That's the colorful thing in the background there. And we made an 18 day trip around the American Southwest. Um, with Casper, Wyoming on the 21st as the focal point of the trip. So this is my family um, wearing our Wyoming uh, bling there. Kind of funny, I ordered those shirts in March and they arrived the week before we left for the trip. <laughs> I guess they were a little overwhelmed by the number of orders they got. Anyway, um, so we were in RV park just to the east side of town. Um, in the morning, it was beautiful, clear sky. You can see in the background up here, it was beautiful, clear sky, but uh, thin cirrus clouds moved in slowly through the morning. I had two cameras going. I had a, uh, a wide-angle camera just trying to catch the shadow moving across. Um, and then I also had a camera on a tracking mount. This is... Uh, whoop, back that up. This is a ZWO monochrome camera with a 135 millimeter lens. And I decided just to make it extra challenging to try to image in calcium K, both the face and the corona, um, mostly because I hadn't found anybody else who had tried to do this before. So um, it was a bit of a science experiment, and I'm going to put together a little presentation later on in the year about uh, how it all came about. But. That was the main close-up camera, and then the, just an um, uh, imaging source brand camera for the wide view. So the, f the first time lapse is from the wide view camera, and I'm assuming that Chris will have to start that based on past experience. The camera took uh, one image every five. Fish eye. fish eye, please. So the camera took one frame every five seconds. So it's about 75 times sped up. And you can see the thin cloud that started to move through, through the morning. But it was luckily thin enough that uh, it didn't impact the view of the totality. I'm not sure if you guys, the other guys in the Casper area had a similar view. 
probably similar. I think in Riverton, which was further west, they had clear skies. So you can see the sun starting to move in. It, it was gradual at first, but very quickly it got much darker, and the temperature dropped from the mid-90s down well into the 70s, which was kind of interesting to, to witness. And then after third contact, this big band moved in, and I basically gave up on trying to capture the last half because it was uh, too thick. And we're all deliberating here. Hey, oh, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> all right, the, uh, the next time lapse was from the other camera. And it starts out with um, one frame every minute for the partial phase. And then once we're in totality, it was uh, about once every second, each frame. And you can see the, the light cloud moving over did impact the view a little bit, but uh, it wasn't too bad. What it amazed me was that the uh, prominences were really, really easy to see. Even at uh, a, f a fraction of a second exposure, they, they were visible once the totality started. But the corona was, was less so. I went as high as 10 seconds exposure, as you'll see in the still frame at the end. Uh, but it still wasn't, it was visible, but not very visible. So. I think I can advance to the next frame. Maybe not. Oh, he's gotta go back into PowerPoint. Okay. Back into PowerPoint? That's it? Yeah, that's it. So this is just a composite of some of the frames through the whole course of the eclipse. Um, these two are actually the same image, just with the, uh, the uh, tone map adjusted to pull out as much as I could of the corona. Uh, so you can see this, uh, the prominences were very easily visible in calcium K. And there is a, a little bit of the inner corona visible. Uh, but I would have needed to go a much longer exposure, I think, to pull them out. And I haven't looked up yet to see what that was. It's a star, but I don't know which one yet. That's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. All right. Ingrid. Yeah, so I'll bring this. Oh, and the green laser, sure. Yeah, I was, was going to go for the big fat one, yeah, the, the I'll ones. Try to put back the other one. Okay. And, uh, have, do you have the wireless mic already? Yeah, I've got the. Okay. I've got everything. So I actually went all the way out to uh, Idaho. Um, if you, uh, I, I, I found a, a GPX track that I could put into OSIMAND to show me where the center line was, and then I realized that I wanted to have the top and the bottom. Thank you. So I uh, went to the NASA site and I found the, the coordinates, stuck them into OSIMAND so I could figure out where I wanted to go. And watching, you know, Watching carefully where the, the weather and the clouds were, I started narrowing it down on, on Idaho, and I didn't like how the moisture reports were north of Pocatello, so I went north of Boise instead to a, a tiny little place called Tripod Reservoir. And when you zoomed in, you discover something very interesting. This lower track was from the NASA coordinates, uh, from the, the numeric ones, and this is from the GPX track that was created out of the Google Maps, also published by NASA. I don't know why there's a 100 meter difference between the center track, but I didn't really care. I thought I was close enough, so. <laughs> uh, for anybody who wants the gory details, 
uh, the video recording I took said that, that it was two minutes, 13 seconds, and that's, you know, and that's what this number says, but boy, it felt like it was 15 seconds. Um, uh, yeah, I should go back to the map for a second. I want to point out, I'm at Tripod Reservoir, which is Idaho fish and game, and you can cap there for free for, for up to seven days. And down the road, maybe two kilometers away, is Smith's Ferry, and there's a little bridge over there. And there's a huge field where they were renting out spots for RVs, and then there's another smaller field that was a boat launch where they were, were renting out parking spots, and then there was a Cougar Mountain Lodge. So this is a picture of Cougar Mountain Lodge, and I have to go back and read it for sure because it really does say $100 just to, to camp your RV and there's like no services, no water, no hydro, no nothing, just, just to camp overnight was 100 bucks, and to park for, during the event was 25 And that, that huge lot across the river, that, that giant field that was filled with RVs, they had apparently been taking reservations online and you can't read it, it says reservations required and it said lots full by the time I got there and I'm like, they're going, Wow, I have no idea how much they were charging for that, and I just didn't want to know. I thought car pa parking, camping for free at, at Tripod Reservoir was a better deal. So this is this is what the the, the vertical thing looked like. So it's a really nice little reservoir, lo lots of camp spots all, all the way around the, the the in the woods, perfectly fine. Uh, there's a little that's where the parking lot was, and I decided that I wanted to have a view down into the valley to to see. I, I'm not a photographer. This is my first eclipse. I had two cell phones that I was, you know, one was taking pictures of the sun and was one when I just sat on video for 20 minutes to, to look at, at the valley for the shadows. And that's all I had. And I, I want, I originally was going to be on the, the two, in, two foot strip between the road and the, the cliff, but I'm afraid of heights and you had to look down, so I went and I scrambled up the 10 feet above the road, so you can see the road 10 feet down there from, from the perch, and that's the tree that I stuck the video camera on. And I'm like easily a quarter mile away from the, the, the parking lot where everybody else was, was gathered. And I thought, oh, how sad, I won't be with, with other people, won't hear what other people have to say. But yeah, anyways. Before and after, I used my fingers to make a little little pinhole, and that's what it looked like before, and that's what it looked like after. So there's the little pinhole shots. Now, one of the things they, if if you try to Google for eclipse shots, you'll find, firstly, a lot of shots of crowds of people looking up at eclipses with eclipse glasses, and you'll find some really beautiful multiple exposure done, you know, layers in, in Photoshop and, and, and coronas that are, sorry, I think they're underexposed because the sky's still black. And you'll find an awful lot of articles why you can't take pictures of, of an eclipse. And the answer is, if you try to take one single picture, you'll get it simultaneously overexposed and underexposed. So the moon here is almost entirely washed out. And if you look really, really, really hard, you'll see that there's a little bit of a trail down there and a little bit of a trail there and that, that's, that's just terribly underexposed there. You just, you just can't see it. So I gave up and I drew a picture of what I saw. And this is what it looked like. The sky was intensely blue. It's not black like you see in all the pictures. The corona was huge and solidly white and went way down. This is Regulus. There's a, a, another spiky corona going off there, and then there's some wiggly bits off, off to the side there. And this is as, as close as my negligible artistic activities can show you, but it's, it's wildly different than all the pictures that you'll see. So I also took a bit of a video of the shadows going across the, uh, the, the, the valley, and I'm hoping that um, you'll be able to, woohoo, run it. Or not? No, it's just an ordinary cell phone. So um, I did the I sped it up so you can see the speed ups there. So that was six. So there's like ten minutes that I sped up to sixty times. There's almost no darkening now. This, this is at 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 uh, uh, single speed, and if you could hear the soundtrack, you could actually hear the people from a quarter mile away going woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what it looked like with totality, and the whole place goes completely dark. And, and like I said, 
subjectively, it felt like it was like maybe 15, maybe 20 seconds. And then after a very short while, it just started lightening back up. And you can see the far side is still dark for a moment because the, the shadow moves at like a thousand miles an hour or something silly like that. Now I left this running for a little bit longer because you can see the dust, it's still partial, and you can see the cars starting to leave from that giant field across the river. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the dust eventually from a car that was from the parking lot getting kicked up. And even though this is like sped up 20 times, you can see the cars stopped on the bridge going across the river. They actually had Department of, uh, Idaho Department of Transportation people down at the intersection at the bottom of the, of the hill uh, because it's just a stop sign. And there's no way that those people on the bridge would ever have had a chance to get, a, get, a, get their left turn in without the, the people doing it. It took about three hours before the traffic calmed down enough for the Department of, of, of Transportation people to no longer need to do the, uh, the traffic control. Anyways, there you go. Thanks very much. That was, uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh oh, what am I doing? I think I was pushing a button. So we're going to use a wireless mic now, Chris? Is that? Sure. Okay. Uh, Rick? All right. Okay, we've been, I've been thinking about this eclipse for about 15 or 20 years now, and we decided uh, to head for the middle of the country where we would have uh, good ability to move east and west. Uh, so we went out, out west where the prospects were fairly good and we had maximum mobility. So wanting to spend as little time in uh, south of the border in the evil empire, uh, as little time and money as we could. Uh, we went north, camping all the way, lovely day, uh, four day trip out to a little hotel in, in Altona. By the way, when you're in Geraldton, stop at the Chinese restaurant there. Wow, <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, and also in Altona, hit Angie's Pizza in behind the Altona Hotel, spectacular. Oh, wrong way. Okay. So the plan was we, we booked a hotel in Omaha. We did that about three or four weeks before the eclipse. It's about an hour, hour and a half off uh, the path of totality. And we got in at the Courtyard Marriott for 99 bucks a night, which is like ridiculous. And, and when we arrived, she told us, it's a good thing you didn't wait until the weekend to book. She says the price rocketed up to $169 a night. I mean, I told her that people were paying 1000 up here. But anyway, so the plan was Sunday to drive from Altona to Omaha, 8 hours and 40 minutes, 960 kilometers. And uh, so we did that. And then spent about two hours going over all the, the numerical models, satellite pictures and everything, fretting and worrying about where were we going to actually go. You can see there's, there's my color guide to the eclipse, uh, phone, magazines, my laptop. So finally decided that we had two choices. One was to go about seven or 800 kilometers east into Tennessee and Kentucky. The other was to go seven or 800 kilometers west to the uh, west end of Nebraska, and that, was, uh, that appeared to be a much more likely option, so that's what we, we did. So there's our trip from Omaha. We left at 4 o'clock in the morning, down the interstate, up past Grand Island, where there were, I think, like 100 Canadians, and off up, and finally uh, hoping to end up with that kind of a view in Alliance, Nebraska. So as the sun as twilight started on our drive, you can see it was, in fact, cloudy. But it wasn't going to stay cloudy. It was going to get better as we got closer. <laughs> Wrong. So about two hours of fairly dense fog and drizzle. And I thought, but that's OK, because 
That almost always burns off with the sunshine. Almost always. Unless it's an upslope flow, in which case it might last for days. <sighs> anyway, a couple of hours later, it started to break up, and things were looking really good, and we were so happy and calm, and, and there was hardly any traffic, and then it started clouding over again. And then it cleared off again, and then it clouded over again, and it kept doing it. It did that about three times uh, before it finally broke open. Uh, this, this interesting, Trump Pence poster was the only political thing we saw on the whole trip, I'm happy to say. So, there's Alliance. Uh, we come in on the main highway here. Uh, there was a great big field down here full of trailers and stuff. We continued right through town just to see what was going on. And when we got down to the end, it was a really nice open parking lot at the big Kmart. And, and I was quite amazed. There was hardly anybody there. I mean, you know, probably 100, 150 cars in each of the major parking lots. But uh, certainly lots, lots of space. And you can see there's a little bit of queue. Uh, but it was, it was clearing. Things were improving, so again, the ultimate relief. We didn't have to worry anymore. I walked around, took pictures of some of the other people uh, who were observing. Uh, almost everybody I talked to was from Colorado, oddly enough. These guys had quite the setup. This is like a 50-foot motor home, and in case it clouds over, they've got the TV there so they can watch it. Uh, this nice young family, uh, as much as anything, I took the picture because they have exactly the same car we do. But anyway, they were all sitting out watching the eclipse. You can see, after our initial relief, it started to cloud over again. And we were getting fairly worried. But as you can see here, as the partial phases continued, you get the cooling, the queue settles down, and essentially all the cloud evaporated. So this is our setup. The, the car with my tripod here, my wife on her on our little low chair. These are two Swedes who flew to New York and then drove off to, uh, to Nebraska to watch the eclipse. And they, they just stood there and watched, didn't do a, a thing, just watched, which was a very sensible thing to do. Here you can see sort of my setup. Uh, basically, it's just a DSLR, 300 millimeter lens with a little cardboard solar filter on it. I was determined to spend as little time photographing as possible and as much time looking, so we had binoculars, solar filters and everything, and, and focused primarily on the looking. So during the partial phases, that's not what we're really there for. So every so often I would take a quick shot. So this is just with a 300 millimeter lens. And so then, once we got into totality, pop off the solar filter, and what I did was I set the camera, I think, on a two thousandth of a second, and would just click the shutter a couple of times, crank it three clicks to, to go one stop longer exposure, and I just, and so entirely while I'm watching, I'm just going, what? click, 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 flick, click, 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 click. So I wasn't paying attention to the photography at all. So a two thousandth of a second, thousandth, And you can see the, the corona, the, the prominences were really nice. Uh, we looked at this with binoculars, and, uh, and it truly is an amazing sight. There you can see Regulus starting to come up. And I think that's the last of that bunch. Nope, there we are. And then the diamond ring hits, and it's basically all over. Um, so, into the partial phases, and I didn't bother hanging around. I stood around going, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get my breath, get my pulse rate down after sort of 12 hours of high stress. So, this is, this is the stack of all the images that are basically done manually in Photoshop. I can't, haven't yet been able to get the stacking software to do a good job for the HDR, but I'm still working on it. And you can see that it's right off against the edge of the frame because I was paying so little attention. I was watching. I wasn't looking at the camera. So. so then the rest of that day we spent driving 700 kilometers back to Omaha. 
stopping on the way occasionally, in this case what my wife calls concrete hinge, it's actually a disused potash factory, and so we would stop every so often to watch the partial phases. Oops. Uh-oh. Well, yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't think there was any more exciting pictures except to say that we, uh, we continued back up to Altona, had another pizza at Angers. So for a total of, I think, 3,400 kilometers in the three days. And then just to top it all off, we went from Altona, two-day drive across to Cypress Hills, where we spent three days at the South uh, Saskatchewan Summer Star Party. And then via visit to relatives up in Sask near Saskatoon, uh, we finished the drive home, getting home at 11.30 Friday night a week ago. Total uh, 10,500 kilometers. So, it was a great trip. And, and as bad as it sounds, you know, driving uh, 700 kilometers across Nebraska and back nonstop, it's beautiful terrain. It was a lovely drive. Um, two other points. Right now, there's some great sunspots on the sun. You should go out and look. Uh, everybody's talking about 2024. The next one's in 2019 in Chile. Uh, and finally, a reminder, this, the Fallen Stars Star Party is on two weeks from today near Belleville. So if you're interested in that. And with that, I will hand the mic back. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Mr. Paul Cloninger and uh, myself here on our on our trek across Canada and into the states there to to see this uh, this eclipse. Paul, oh, oh, sure. Let's start there with the. Okay. Oh, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, wow, what a what a month and uh, what an amazing collection of images uh, from from everybody. Uh, truly, a, a a very unique event. Uh, we started planning this, uh, uh, our expedition out uh, probably at the beginning of the year uh, uh, because it, uh, it required a bit of thought where we wanted to go and as a result, uh, Oscar, myself and friend James McQuig decided to embark on a 14-day, 9,000-kilometer uh, road trip odyssey uh, to, to uh, intercept the uh, moon's shadow but also to see some really cool and fascinating things along the way. So uh, we, uh, we had a close look at what was available and uh, didn't take the most direct route, as you can see, uh, but we certainly did manage to see some, uh, some very uh, interesting uh, uh, places along the way. There you go, Oscar. Yeah, so our first leg of the trip was uh, roughly nine hours from, I guess, Paul and, and James started in, in CARP. Uh, we made our way to uh, Agawa Bay uh, Provincial Park uh, on the north shore of Lake Superior. Uh, so we had a campsite there along the beach. It was, it was quite beautiful and we did some imaging of, of, of the, uh, the sky over that lake. And, uh, and then the next morning we went and checked out uh, some pictographs on, on, on a cliffside uh, just, just on the shore of the lake. Uh, it was pretty cool. We kept referring to that, uh, that, uh, that little guy on the right there as the chupacabra. Uh, there's uh, several little images of him there. He was pretty cool. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next day, we was another nine-hour trek uh, <laughs> from, <laughs> from uh, Agawa Bay to uh, Aaron Provincial Park uh, near the border with Manitoba. It wasn't until until this this road trip that uh, I hadn't realized just how large Ontario is. I mean, it took us <laughs> it took us like three days to get from Ottawa to Manitoba. It was it was ridiculous. Um, we had uh, we were in two cars and I had the walkie-talkies and I was like I wonder how many countries we would have gone through if this trip would have been through Europe. <laughs> um, All of them. Yeah. yeah. So we had we had another beautiful uh, lakeside campsite there at Aaron and this is an image I took uh, just of the moon as it was as it was uh, as it was rising over the lake uh, with uh, some foliage there in the foreground that was kind of hanging precariously on the side of a uh, uh, the shore of the of the. Uh, the lake there was sort of raised over the over the water. I was hoping not to drop my camera because I would need it in a few days for the eclipse. <laughs> Good. Okay, so I can take this one. Yeah. So uh, after uh, Aaron Provincial Park, we we finally did get out of Ontario, and right at the Ontario and uh, Manitoba border, 
There's an interesting uh, um, object there called West Hawk Lake. Is Chuck around today? Did Chuck come? No? This was, this was one I, I wanted to put in for Chuck because this is actually um, a meteor crater. It's uh, t about two and a half kilometers across and uh, 350 million years ago, uh, you didn't want to be in this area. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, an asteroid blasted out a, a nice big hole there and uh, fast forward to 350 million years and uh, nowadays it's used by, uh, by, by this species as a summer playground. And, and of course, to get, uh, to get the odd refreshment. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, West Hawk Lake, so check, I got another meteor on my list there. Not, not as many as uh, Chuck, but uh, yeah, certainly uh, my, my, my crater list is growing. So uh, after, uh, after uh, there we go, a after uh, traveling for a couple more days, we, uh, we went to a place that was a high priority target uh, when we started uh, to plan this trip, and that's Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta. This is a place I'd wanted to see for a long time, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's stunning. It's, it's, it, it's primordial when, when, when you walk through that. And, uh, the, uh, the, the, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and uh, as a result, it's also uh, uh, restricted access into the grounds themselves. Uh, uh, it's not, not kind of a free-for-all. You have to go on a guided tour with, with guides from the park there, and they will uh, they will obviously give you the history of, of the place there, but they will take you to some places that you can't ordinarily access. So, as you can see, this is a, a stunning place, and. Uh, uh, something very catastrophic happened here about 75 million years ago because this place is littered with dinosaur fossils. It's it's absolutely amazing. So and it's and and the landforms are quite unlike anything else I've seen. It's uh, the the geology here is is just fascinating. So we were on our expeditions there. There's Oscar and myself uh, on on the right hand side. James is taking the picture of us, and uh, this is us being led through some of these areas in the park where we can examine these uh, fossil beds. There's active digs going on in this area as well, and uh, it's really it's just a totally fascinating place. Uh, yeah, it's it's like being on another planet. The uh, the landscapes are 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 unreal. The 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 rock formations, um, it, it it leaves you speechless, really. Yeah, there's Oscar doing the millennial thing. Yeah, yeah. Were you watching a video or, or were you taking a selfie here? Uh, <laughs> neither. I was actually taking a panoramic shot of, of, the, uh, of the landscape, I promise. <laughs> but you can see it's, it's, it's absolutely stunning there and uh, you could climb up these, uh, these, these hills and, uh, and get these vistas there and in some ways it was reminiscent of, of areas of the Grand Canyon for me. And for those fans of the Coyote and Roadrunner, <laughs> I just had to include this one. Uh, there you go. I mean, on these guided tours, as I say, we went into some fairly, fairly rugged areas there, and literally there are dinosaur fossils at your feet on the trail as you're going through these places. It was... It, 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 it gave you such a strange feeling to be amongst this stuff and realize that uh, you know, based on what our guide was telling us well, as well, a catastrophic event happened here and, and many, many dinosaurs died over a very short period of time and, uh, and became fossilized. So the place is like littered with, with, uh, with these uh, dinosaur fossils. Quite amazing there. And uh, also on our road trip, we, we, we investigated some other areas uh, uh, in, in that general area. This is... Uh, the entrance to the Badlands uh, uh, in South uh, Dakota, very similar to our own Badlands uh, or, or uh, Dinosaur Park, but different. It's larger. The 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 uh, certainly the topography is has some similarities there, but uh, much more extensive. And uh, I don't think it's as rich in in fossils. Did you want to give a, a an impression of uh, yeah sure of the Badlands there? Yeah, so it was it was very similar to the Badlands in Alberta. Just uh, it, it was a little bit larger in scale. Um, so by this point, Chris, uh, Chris, uh, <laughs> Paul and I had separated and I was, I was going through this area with my girlfriend. We stopped in this small town called Scenic, uh, South Dakota. Uh, we walked into a post office, talked to the postmaster. She told us it was, it was that town had a population of four people. There was a family of three and the, the gentleman maintained the grounds of the, of the town and then there was a, a crazy cat lady. 
uh, and the postmaster herself lived about 15 miles away, so it was kind of strange. Uh, but it was a very barren, barren area. Uh, but just it was it was just incredible to see these these land formations. It was pretty cool. So uh, unlike uh, Dinosaur Park, uh, the uh, as I say, this area, the Badlands of South Dakota, is much more extensive and much larger, and they have some fabulous roads that actually go through there. The, the previous shot that I showed you there, this is me deciding whether I should go on the highway or take the 25 mile rutted dirt back road to see some of the more interesting places. So I chose to do that. I don't think I rattled off too many bolts in my vehicle. Uh, and then I later joined up with, with that highway, but it was worth the trip there because, uh, again, you could climb into some of these ravines uh, and, and check out this place. This is just a dash cam shot that I pulled from, from my camera there as I was driving through. The roads were spectacular, and nobody was rushing. Nobody's rushing through this area. It's just a nice drive, and everybody's taking in the scenery and had a stunning day for it. But there, there, that gives you some of the idea of the type of uh, topography that's there. So I wandered down into some of these gullies there, and it was 41 degrees. It was, uh, the sun was, uh, was blistering that day. There weren't many clouds, and it was uh, just stunning. But the, uh, what really struck me here is the is the layering how, how flat it is and and you can see the different episodes there are obviously depositing different types of materials there but uh, just stunning over vast areas how how straight this this area was so a very very striking uh, a very very striking place not too far from there also visited devil's tower couldn't i couldn't go as, as, as a sci-fi and astronomy kind of guy uh, there's no way I could be in this area and not visit Devil's Tower. So for those of you that know, uh, yeah, close encounters, right? But this is a, this is a fantastic uh, uh, igneous butte that sticks up about 400, or I mean about 900 feet above the base uh, level there. Just, just a phenomenal structure. Uh, I shot, I, I spent all night here. I actually sort of stayed overnight there and shot some time lapse, but I'll show you that at a later point in time when I've had a chance to process it. But uh, just, just a striking, striking object when you see it. And I managed to catch that shot of it just at sundown. So uh, yeah, very cool. I'll let you take it from there. For after that, it was eclipse time. Yeah, so this was, uh, I took this picture in the uh, town of Sheridan in, yep. in Wyoming. Um, and my girlfriend and I were walking up and down the strip. She wanted to do some shopping. And uh, we ran by, uh, we walked by, a lot of the shops had these signs on them saying that they'd be closed on, on Monday for the eclipse. Now Sheridan was about 200 or so kilometers yeah. from, from totality. Uh, so I guess, I don't know whether employers were giving their employees a break there so that they could go see the eclipse. But uh, certainly there was, there was definitely eclipse culture in the, in the air there. It was pretty cool. Um, so this was uh, on our way to Cas or actually I think this is when we this arrived. Is yeah, this is when yeah. we arrived on site the night before uh, the eclipse. So much like Rick, uh, <laughs> we were quite worried when we got there. It was it was clouded over. We had gotten a couple texts from from Eric saying, "Oh man, it's, it's pouring rain here at the site." So we we're getting pretty worried. <laughs> Oops, sorry there. Oh, this is uh, actually. I think the next. I think the next one is one of yours too, there, oh, yeah. because we, we had other than the weather, we we had a few other um, challenges. Let's say we we did have a variety of hardware glitches, software glitches. The gremlins were never far away, but there were more than gremlins, and I'll let you do this one. Yeah. So my girlfriend was <laughs> was walking through this grass field. Uh, we were heading towards a ranch house to say hello to our hosts. And uh, as she's walking through the grass, we hear a very distinct <laughs> So we look down, and uh, lo and behold, we've got this four-foot rattlesnake uh, right in front of us. So it was, it was quite a surprise. Uh, it ended up doing a big circle around us, and then it was kind of sniffing around Paul's tent. And, uh, and, then, he, and then he went off into the distance, and we didn't worry about him. <laughs> Except we were all wearing our boots for the rest of the night. Yeah, <laughs> big time. Yeah, Oscar told me that the snake had slithered like right up against the back of my tent, and somehow I didn't manage to actually do much tent time that night. I just, you know, I was busy with other things, other equipment issues. So. But you can see, oh, go oh, back. Yeah. You can see the size of the rattle on that snake there. It's uh, so getting the pointer. There. It was quite quite an impressive thing. Like this whole segment, there's the rattle on the snake, and uh, yeah, it was it was it was pretty cool. <laughs> I'll let you talk about oh, yeah, sure. there too as well. 
There you go. Yeah, so this was uh, this was the morning of eclipse. Um, I don't exactly recall the time, but I think it was it was uh, before totality. And uh, um, you see, my, my girlfriend there is looking through her eclipse glasses. She's observing the the sun, which is up here, which somehow I didn't catch in this panorama. You think I would have, given that it's the uh, the eclipse? Uh, this is the gear that I was imaging with. I had my uh, sixty millimeter or eighty millimeter um, Skywatcher uh, Apo. And then piggyback on it, I had a uh, 200 millimeter uh, telephoto, um, and then my camera, or my laptop, and my camera there, two cameras uh, were imaging. Uh, and then Paul was over here hunkered on his station. He ran into some last minute uh, software glitches, and every couple of minutes he was he was cursing uh, those of us in the software development uh, industry. He's like, these damn software developers, do they ever test their software? Um, but yeah, so eventually I think it worked out. It did work out. All right. Oh yes, right at the yeah. Yeah, red shirt there and yeah, right. Yeah, that's the ran that's the ranch house uh, of or the the hosts, and they had a forty acre spread here, and they had opened it up to uh, to people uh, interested in coming for the eclipse there. So there was us uh, and another group a little bit further uh, afield there, but we must have had probably about what eighty hundred people there. Or yeah, between the two fields, yeah. Between the two fields, yeah. So, and uh, yeah, there's, so there's my two setups. I, I had a, I had a 70 millimeter uh, Stellar View um, ED Apo and a uh, Canon with a 200 millimeter lens uh, running there as well, so. Uh, before Did we you? get into the imaging, maybe we talk a little bit about the clips there. Sure. Yeah, so one of the things, I mean, and, uh, some people have touched upon it, uh, but one of the things that I found most remarkable about the, about the eclipse and specifically about totality was just, the way it made me feel as a, as a human, um, just that the, the very noticeable dip in temperature was, was, was incredible and not something, it was something I was sort of expecting but not to the degree that, 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 uh, that we experienced it. Uh, it was the, the difference between even, you know, 80% uh, coverage and totality, it was enough that I almost felt I needed to get a sweater on, um, it was that cold, it was, it was pretty impressive. Um, and and once totality hit, it was just it was this is my first solar my first solar eclipse. So just once once that hit, just sort of like nothing else mattered but just looking at this thing and, and admiring uh, not only the beauty but just the just how marvelous the universe is that we we have these coincidences. Uh, the size of the moon is just the right size to to produce such a such a phenomenal event. Um, it was also my girlfriend's first time seeing an eclipse, and, and she was she was totally touched, like she was in tears, and it was it was pretty incredible. It was cool. Yeah, it was a, it was it's quite a breathtaking experience. There, it's really kind of beyond words. But uh, what Oscar really hit on the temperature, and I, I really noticed that because we uh, it was about thirty thirty one degrees uh, Celsius when uh, you know prior to the, uh, the beginning of the event there. And in those last, in the, in the last like two minutes before the eclipse, it must have dropped about 10 or 12 degrees Celsius. It was tangible. It was, it was amazing how, how quickly it dropped and how quickly the light faded, especially in the last 60 seconds. So without further ado, I'll show, we'll show you uh, what we managed to capture there. This is the, uh, the sun uh, just prior to the, uh, to the start of the partial phase. Um, as you've seen in a number of images there, we had some nice sunspots there, which, is, which was actually kind of cool because they provided you a bit of a reference to, to gauge the, uh, the, how quickly the moon was moving across the face. So that's 80 minutes before the, 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 the uh, first partial phase uh, lasted about 80 minutes before totality. And then just a couple of uh, shots here showing uh, the sun creeping down, or the moon creeping down over the sun there, covering a greater and greater proportion. That's about what I think was visible in Ottawa, roughly, uh, but uh, 60 odd percent. Uh, this is 32 minutes before totality, and creep down to 11 minutes. And uh, it's interesting just watching people there. There was a kind of a hush going on because people were looking at their gear and making sure they had everything ready. And that really became noticeable there, with just a, about a, a minute and a half to yeah, go. Yeah, and people were shutting out countdowns. Uh, we had folks saying 30 seconds of totality, and it was it was pretty cool. Everyone was really excited. Yeah, it was, uh, it was good that we had those counters there because, uh, as somebody else already mentioned, the time seems to dilate when you're, when you're, when you're in this event there. Um, the, the, last, 
that last few minutes just seemed before totality seemed to go very quick and we were all kind of crossing our fingers hoping that our gear was 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 ready and good to go but uh, that last minute and a half after after this uh, the uh, the filters came off uh, computers were uh, instructed to run their scripts um, and uh, that's when the magic started so we got into totality and it was just an absolutely stunning sight there the uh, you, you could see the prominences uh, around the edge of the sun, and that's one of the things that really stuck in my mind uh, with this event was that with the naked eye, you could actually see the reddish part of the, of the rim of the, uh, of the upper part of the moon there, and it was just vivid red. It was, it was, it was absolutely phenomenal. So even we, we had a bit of thin cirrus at, at the time, but it didn't really impede the view at all. We could see the corona, as you can see here, and, uh, and the prominences were very prominent, if I can put it that way. <laughs> so this is 12 seconds into, uh, into totality. Uh, a deeper exposure, again, shows the corona there, the, uh, the, the delicate nature of these, uh, of these streamers falling along the, the magnetic lines. Uh, quite impressive there. It was, uh, it was very visible to the, to the naked eye. And uh, down at the bottom here, a uh, very bright star, Regulus, only about a degree and a half away from, from the moon itself. Oscar, yeah. there you go. So this is my, uh, my image for totality as well. Uh, so I'm still trying to get the hang of, of, of some of the HDR processing involved uh, in this kind of an imagery. And, uh, but I managed to, to sneak out some of the detail in the, in the feathering in the corona, which, which I liked. And you can sort of see a little bit of the, some of these prominences there. Um, and then the next slide, I've got this uh, composite of, of uh, we've got our prominences there. Uh, I believe these were coming into totality. Mm -hmm. uh, got our Bailey's beads uh, with our prominences. Uh, more Bailey's beads, I think uh, this one came first and then that one. Uh, and then kind of a Bailey's bead slash diamond ring on the, just after uh, third contact. So I was uh, lucky enough to get this shot. This was about one second or so before the, uh, the official end of totality. We had a total of 144 seconds uh, on site of, of totality there. And so cameras were snapping all along the way. And uh, as I mentioned, this is about just about a second before totality ended there. You get the, uh, the diamond ring, the, the sunlight shining through uh, one of the deeper valleys uh, of the moon there. And it was, uh, it was quite noticeable and quite impressive. Um, I had miscalculated, well, I, I kind of fudged my exposure script at the last minute because of software developers. Um, but, uh, and so I managed to actually get a couple of shots afterwards where I really should have put on my filter. So this is, this is my diamond ring and the next shot is kind of the Liz Taylor of diamond rings. Uh, I know some of you obviously know who I'm referring to. Uh, so this is four seconds after the official end of totality. You can see that it's already brightening up quite substantially there. Uh, you can see the kind of thin cirrus uh, clouds that we were dealing with. And I did actually snap one more exposure with the filter off. Probably shouldn't have done that, but it, I don't think it did any damage. That one was seven seconds afterwards. And again, you can see a, a number of stars here, uh, or at least you can see Regulus on this one. The rest are blotted out there. But uh, yeah, it, it, the cloud looks worse than it was because this was a longer exposure and so it, it, it really brightened it up. But think about it, this is a really tiny, thin, thin sliver of the sun that's showing. In fact, the next exposure was with filters on only a few seconds later. Uh, yeah, that's 10 seconds. Filters were on and uh, you can see just how thin a sliver was actually visible uh, of, the, uh, of, of the sun at this point in time. So yeah, quite impressive there. And uh, then that, that obviously marked the end of the total phase and we bopped out uh, on the other side there. Interesting again to watch the moon's progression against the, uh, the sunspots. And I captured this view afterwards and uh, we got off really, really lucky. Yep, yep we got, uh, that was our observing location. This is some of the thin cloud that we were dealing with. And uh, I think this is some of the stuff that Rick was uh, having to deal with. That's uh, Nebraska down that way. And uh, you can see there was some pretty angry stuff in the, uh, in the area there. But uh, yeah, this image, uh, 
um, taken from uh, one of the satellites, the GEO satellites there, uh, just 12 minutes prior to totality there. And you can see uh, we, uh, we very nearly could have been snookered with those clouds there, but uh, the weather gods did, uh, did uh, win out over the gremlins there and we won. So uh, leave you with that image, that last one. That's, uh, I, what I tried to do is produce an image that, that as closely approximated what I remember visually um, when, when totality was in progress there. So we could see the earth shine on the moon. Uh, even, even though we had some thin haze, the corona was very pronounced, with, especially with these three very prominent spikes. And you can see a number of stars actually in the image. There's, uh, I think I recorded seven stars uh, in total in the image. Uh, Mercury and Venus were, uh, uh, yeah, Mercury and Venus were also visible, but they're definitely off frame um, from my field of view there. But, uh, you know, thin clouds aside, uh, I don't think anybody on site there complained with, with, what, uh, with what had just happened and what we just saw. They didn't take away from, it may have, may have dulled the clarity of some of the images there, but it certainly didn't take away from the experience. It was, uh, it, it, is a, it is a totally unique and remarkable event and I strongly encourage you to try to check it out in 2024. Like that's seven years from now, I'm, I'm already getting a serious seven year hitch. <laughs> I'm telling you. So I'll, I'll be there, the good Lord willing and able, and uh, hopefully the, all, many of you will be able to check that out too because it's gonna be right in our backyard. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and I think that concludes our program for tonight. Um, <laughs> So this, this book is actually already available uh, from Fred Espin. No, I'm serious. It's uh, $15 US. I was, I was looking at it to myself. Uh, so it's got all sorts of maps um, for all the roadways along, along the path of totality for uh, the 2024 eclipse. Uh, this is where we are. As you can see, it's only probably 75, 80 clicks uh, down to, to get to, to the path of totality. But... Uh, you know, two or three hundred kilometers down to the uh, to the central line. Um, I don't know Kingston, this this area in April. Mm, I don't know. I think I'm gonna be I'm gonna be further south. I think. Um, yes, our star parties. I think we've got one left. Um, they occur at the parking lot of the Carp uh, Library. Uh, just so, just near the Diefen bunker. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess we've got two left. Uh, September fifteenth and sixteenth with a no rain date. Oh, I guess a, a rain date of sixteenth uh, of September, and we've got a members only uh, party uh, at FLO uh, on the twenty third. Uh, yes, the. Night Sky course uh, offered by, I think, Pat Brown runs this one at the Mill of Contail. Um, starting uh, Friday, September 22nd, uh, you should check it out. Uh, I, I've, I've been to it, it's, pretty, it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good program that's put together there. Yes, we've got a new mailing list uh, in place now. Uh, it's, uh, we're moving off of our current web host and uh, our mailing list is now hosted through Google Groups. Uh, so any of you that were already on the on the mailing list uh, have been migrated over to the uh, to the Google Groups mailing list. It'll function just the same way as it as it did before. Uh, if you want to reach the people on on the list, you fire off an email to rascottawa at googlegroups.com, and it'll reach everyone on the list. Please um, only send astronomy related uh, email to this to this particular account. Um, and it reaches about 80% of the membership of the center, so it's quite a wide-reaching list. Uh, and when you renew and when you sign up, you have, uh, you have the option to opt in into the list, or you can ask uh, Chris Terran or any of the uh, folks that, that help run the club uh, to get added to it. Estelle's pick of the month uh, is Galileo's Daughter by Deva Sobel, so you, sh you should uh, check it out. Estelle will be uh, at our library, which is just behind me here to the right uh, after the meeting. Um, membership benefits, uh, so regular membership is $75, a family membership is 70, 
plus 11 per adult, 550 for youth, and a youth membership is $45. You get access to the uh, Ted Bean Loan Library, the Sten Mott Library, uh, as well as access to the site at FLO. Um, you also receive discounts on Sky News, and, uh, and you also get a copy of the Observer's Handbook every year, uh, Astronauts and, and the uh, Society's Journal. Uh, these are our the folks that uh, help this club uh, run. And uh, our meetings are always broadcast on Ustream. Check out our, our, uh, our link there. And uh, thanks for Eric. Uh, thanks to Eric for making that happen. Uh, and all the videos for the meetings are always archived on our site. We had an audience of 148 people tonight, so thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, and thanks to the uh, to the museum for hosting us. Uh, and as always, we'll have the after meeting uh, meeting at at Gracie's. Um, so check it out. We usually sit around, have a chat, uh, compare notes, and, uh, and then share a couple of drinks. So it's it's a good time. Next meeting is uh, October thirteenth. It is the second Friday. Once again, I think these uh, long weekends are are pushing our meetings out one one week. Um, and I think Kelly will be back for that one, hopefully. In the meantime, thank you and a big congratulations for Oscar for chairing his first meeting. Thank you. Thank you for being a wonderful audience.